website and Shannon if hasn't already is going to be putting the slides um, into the chat and the recording will also be posted. Shannon's really good. She usually gets it up within a day or two, all of the materials. So um, if you would like, we always would love to see your faces. So if you want to turn your cameras on, that would be great. Um, we certainly understand that that's not going to work out for you today. If you're having a bad hair day, it's all good. <laughs> um, and if at any point you have questions, you please don't feel like you have to wait for us to pause or invite questions. Um, you know, put things in chat, uh, raise your hand, just unmute and start speaking. We will answer as many questions as we can during our time together. We have quite a bit of content to cover uh, depending upon how many questions we are. Hopefully we'll be able to get to all of them. If not, what we'll do is I know I can stay on for a bit at the end and answer any questions that we didn't get to. Um, and, you know, Shannon and I, as well as our entire team at Housing Innovations is always available to you guys all the time. Um, and our contact information is one of the last slides in the deck that we're going to use today. So <clears throat> we know I apologize for my voice. I'm a little sick. Um, we know that some of you are new and so we will try not to use a whole bunch of acronyms without explaining what they are. But if at any point Shannon and I fall into speaking in alphabet soup and you have no idea what we're talking about, please stop us because if you feel that way, there, there are others um, who are likely to feel that way and we need to do a better job for you at explaining. So, okay, next slide. So this is our agenda for today. Um, we Today is not intended to be like an in-depth compliance training, right? We're not gonna go through every single standard in the monitoring guide. Uh, that's way too much content for a 90 minute presentation. And we've got a mixed crowd today, right? So we've got people who have uh, you know, been around the block many times and have had projects monitored several times probably. And then we've got some people who are probably brand new to all of this. And so. Our goals for today are going to be to cover just some basic information about what monitoring is and what you can expect um, if you get a, a notice from us saying that one of your COC projects is going to be um, is going to be monitored. We're going to cover new content in the monitoring guide, so things that have been changed or added to the guide within the last two years, so in 2023 and then for the upcoming monitoring period in 2024. Um, we're going to talk about some strategies that you can use in your programs to avoid some of the most common monitoring findings. Uh, we're going to talk about some strategies for what to do if, uh, when, because monitoring findings always happen if you're monitored, so what to do uh, to address those findings, um, as well as how to prepare if you get a notice from HUD that they are going to be coming out to monitor your program. Um, and as always, we will uh, be giving you a bunch of information on where you can find additional training and and uh, and resources. And so so excuse me, throughout our slides today, you'll see text in green that's underlined and those are all uh, live hyperlinks. So you can uh, click on those and have access to more information. Next slide. Actually, you can move forward two slides. Um, so just before we get started, for anyone that's brand new to all of this, when we say monitoring, what we basically mean is monitoring is an assessment of whether your projects that get uh, funded through the continuum of care um, are, you know, using those funds in a way that's aligned with the funder's expectations. And so when we monitor projects, um, we look at your policies, we look at your case management practices, right? We look at the project as a whole, and the goal is to determine the extent to which the project is following all of the requirements from the federal government, from the from Connecticut, from the state, um, as well as uh, any policies that have been passed locally by the Connecticut Balance of State Continuum of Care. And so we do this for a number of different reasons, right? It's a requirement. So HUD requires that all continuums of care across the country monitor the projects that they fund. They also require, so a lot of our projects in Connecticut, the money uh, comes from HUD to either DEMAS or DOH, uh, the Depart Connecticut Department of Housing. So DEMAS and DOH hold the grant agreement with HUD. They are considered the recipients of the grant agreement. And then they pass on that money to nonprofit agencies as the subrecipients. And HUD also requires that where there's that structure in a grant, 
that the recipient is required to monitor their subrecipients as well. So we don't monitor every project every year. That would be a lot for everyone. Um, so we, we basically select, and we'll talk about the criteria that we use to select in a moment. Um, we select a subset of projects that are gonna get monitored every year. And when I say we, I don't mean we, me, and Shannon. I mean, um, I mean uh, the, the Connecticut Balance of State co-chairs select uh, which projects are gonna get monitored for CT Boss, and then Demis selects which of their projects we are gonna monitor. And so there are eight agencies that have been selected for monitoring in 2024. Um, some of those agencies have more than one COC project and we uh, may be monitoring more than one project when we come out. So it's more than eight projects, but just eight agencies. Next slide. So what we're trying to accomplish when we monitor, the main thing is really to, is, it really is intended to be a support for you guys, right? It's really intended that the, the rules for all this stuff are extremely complicated. There are literally probably thousands of pages between the regulations and the notices and the policies at the state and the COC level. It's a lot, right? And so our goal is to help make that all understandable for you guys so you know what the expectations of your funders are and that's really the main goal of monitoring <clears throat> we also when we come out want to help to make sure that if you get a notice that you're going to be monitored by hud that you're prepared for that monitoring right um, and most importantly we want to make sure that you don't have to give any money back so when HUD comes out and monitors, uh, if there are findings, like so for example, you spent money on an ineligible activity or you served an ineligible participant, HUD will ask for that money back and we don't wanna see that happen. So the goal is for us to come and find those things so that you can fix them so that when HUD comes back, you've got, um, you know, you're, you're in really good shape. And then lastly, we definitely use monitoring for us to help our team see where we need to be doing a better job of helping you guys to understand the rules and to provide training and technical assistance um, on those very complicated rules all right next slide and so we always like to say like don't you know don't worry about it if you get a finding right findings are you know I don't think we've ever done a monitoring where there isn't at least one finding, right? The rules are so complicated, it's, it's, you're not going to be 100% in compliance. So getting a finding is not a big deal, right? The goal is that, um, is that you know like where you've got some compliance risk um, so that you can make the adjustments, right? It's really an opportunity to course correct. Next slide. So we know that you, your projects, right, your staff, your teams are absolutely inundated, um, you know, with work, right? You've got, uh, you know, people who are in critical, sometimes life-threatening situations, um, and you are sometimes literally preventing them from freezing to death on the streets, right? And that that important work has to be your top priority, and that you're doing that within this incredibly difficult context of an intense housing shortage in the state of Connecticut, really all across the whole country, but um, in particular in the state of Connecticut, and that your primary focus is on you know, helping uh, folks to get housing and to sustain that housing as it should be, right? And so we really, um, you know, we don't want you to have to weed through thousands of pages of rules and regulations, right? We really see that as our job. Um, and we try to summarize it all for you and present it all for to you in ways that are manageable. Um, and so, and we try to do that in a way that feels efficient to you guys, right? So that we're taking up as little of your precious time as possible um, on this stuff so that you can be focused on the important work that you're doing um, with the participants in your, in your program. So if you, we are always open to your ideas about how we can be doing that better and more efficiently. So please don't hesitate to let us know uh, what ideas you have. And then we also understand that, you know, it's probably not possible for you to be 100% compliant all the time, right? And so we really try through monitoring to help you guys um, make informed decisions about compliance risk management. So we try to help you understand what your big biggest risks are so that you can prioritize which are the most important things for you to correct sooner rather than later. 
Um, <clears throat> so, you know, so again, our, our goal is to help you guys to understand and follow all of the requirements. At the same time, the steering committee, the Connecticut Balance of State Steering Committee is responsible for being good stewards of these funds. And we report to the steering committee, right? And to DEMAS when we're monitoring their projects. And so, um, and so there are times, right? When the steering committee could have to make a difficult decision, right? So I'm saying, don't worry about the findings, right? But at the same time, there's certain findings that you gotta make sure you correct, right? Because the steering committee could make a decision that if there was a project that, you know, was monitored multiple times and is making absolutely no progress, around you know correcting very significant findings the steering committee could make a decision to reallocate that funding which basically means to stop funding that project and to use that money for a different project instead now that is certainly not our goal it's not what happens usually because normally what happens is we come out we monitor programs correct the things that they need to correct at least the most important things that need to be corrected all right next slide um, oh, sorry, that was the slide we were just on. My bad. Move to the next slide. I didn't cue you. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so I'm just going to pause for a minute to see if anybody has any questions before I keep going. I know I'm talking a lot. Someone just asked in the chat um, if every agency has been notified yet that will be monitored. And I just said not everyone. There are a few that are happening later in the spring that haven't yet been notified. Thank you, Shannon. Um, so these next couple of slides just give you a sense of how um, the uh, chairs and DEMAS select projects to be monitored. And these criteria, they've not changed. They're the same criteria that we've been using for the past few years, and they were established by the steering committee a while back. And so um, basically, we prioritize larger grants, right? Because the larger the grant, the more risk there is of funding being recaptured by HUD. Um, if you've never been monitored before, we are slowly making our way through all of the agencies that get Connecticut uh, CT boss money. So if you've never been monitored before, you are likely to be monitored, if not this year, in one of the next you know, few years. We're trying to get everyone monitored at least once. Um, if you are brand new to the COC, right, it is a lot for people to manage all of these rules, even if you've been around for a long time. If your agency is brand new to the COC, we try to monitor like quickly as we can so that um, we can help you, uh, you know, learn all of the requirements and be in compliance with all of the requirements. And then if we've come out and monitored before and you've had a lot of significant findings, uh, then we're likely to come back just to check in to see uh, how the progress is going on correcting those findings. Next slide. We also, um, if you've done poorly um, on renewal evaluation, particularly if you've done poorly for several years in a row on your renewal evaluation, that makes it more likely that you're gonna get monitored. If you're not fully spending all of your funds, that makes it more likely that you get monitored. If we get a complaint, which this is very rare, um, you know, so every once in a blue mood, HUD, you know, gets a complaint and then asks us to look into it. Um, so that might be a reason why you get monitored. And then, and then basically any other evidence that there might be of, you know, something that's going on at the program that is not aligned with what the funders expect, um, you, might, you might get monitored. Next slide. Actually, you can move forward to two slides, Shannon. So, um, so this next set of things, we're just going to be talking about what to expect, right? So, um, so the monitoring guide, um, you know, is that it's linked here on the slide and it's basically all of the standards that we could look at when we come out and monitor. So it takes all of those thousands of pages that I've been talking about um, and it condenses it into a much shorter, although still quite long document of, I don't know how many pages it is now, 30, 40, something like that. Um, so, and it's really, monitoring is really meant to be a, um, a transparent process. I see there's someone um, in the chat. I'll just get through this slide and then I'll answer that question. So um, monitoring is really meant to be a transparent process, right? So all of the things that we potentially are gonna look at are in that guide. So you know before we come what we're potentially gonna be looking at. Now we don't look at every single requirement in the guide every time we come because it's too much to do in a day. Um, and because some of the things are only relevant to certain, to certain project types. 
the guide also cites like we don't just make things up willy nilly that we're going to monitor you on right so everything that's in there is connected um, either to just the best practice recommendation sometimes but usually to either a HUD requirement, a state requirement, or a policy. And it'll say for each standard, what's the underlying requirement that um, is that establishes this standard. It's not Shannon and I making it up. Um, and then there's also a bunch of links to resources in the guide. All right, so there was a question in chat, Shannon. Yeah, what what is considered poor performance on the annual was annual renewal. So annual renewal evaluation is different from what we're talking about here, but it, that says annual renewal evaluation, a score lower than a certain number. Yeah. So the, so generally speaking, the, um, well, not generally speaking, every year the steering committee establishes what they, uh, what we call the corrective action threshold. So agencies that fall below that corrective action threshold are going to be more likely to be monitored. Um, but you could do well on your renewal evaluation and still get and still get and still get monitored. Um, it, it, there's not there's you know what we've learned is that an agency can be doing very well. It's two different things, right? The renewal evaluation looks at outcomes, right, and the monitoring looks at compliance. So you could be doing very well on your outcomes, but be very out of compliance with requirements. All right, next slide. Were there other things in the chat, Shanna? That's it. All right. Um, so, so these are basically the different things that we do when we monitor a program. So the first thing is we tell you that we're going to be monitoring your program. So at least four weeks and usually more like six or eight weeks um, before a proposed date for monitoring, you'll get an email um, that says that your project or projects have been selected for monitoring. That uh, that notification will include a whole list of things that we would like you to submit in advance of monitoring. Um, you'll submit those things. We'll look at those things. We'll ask you questions about those things. And then on the day that we're actually doing the remote monitoring, and we'll talk about remote monitoring in a moment, um, at the beginning of the day at 9 a.m., we'll all meet on Zoom um and go over exactly what the day is going to look like answer any questions that you have for us we'll have some questions for you then um then shannon and i will spend and sometimes howard on our team or alicia also on our team sometimes involved in monitoring um we'll spend the bulk of our day looking at um participant charts so what we'll do is about two days before Two, if you need more than that, let us know. Three days, four days, you know, uh, uh, somewhere in that window, we'll send you a list of documents that we're going to be uh, reviewing from your participant files. So, for example, it'll say, you know, upload the service plan for client ID one, two, three, four, upload six months of case notes for client ABCD, right? Like, so you'll get a list of specific documents for specific clients that we want to see. Um, we'll, Shannon and I will spend most of our day reviewing those documents. And so you don't need to be with us, right? Like we don't, you can go about your regular day. Um, Howard on our team will um, meet with somebody, assuming that uh, we are monitoring a nonprofit agency. Howard will meet with someone from your fiscal team um and um and uh do the fiscal review for any nonprofit agency that gets coc funds so if you are uh the service provider for the project but you are not getting any coc funds you're funded for example by demis for that there is no fiscal review um and then either shannon or i or sometimes alethea We'll meet with a case manager on your team and we'll meet if you are able to identify somebody who is willing to meet with us, a client that you provide services for. Um, and then at the end of the day, we'll all gather again on Zoom and we'll tell you what we found, right? So that there are no surprises for you. So by the end of the day, in that exit interview, you'll know where you're gonna see findings on your, on your report. And you're also gonna have a chance to tell us that we missed something or we got something wrong, right? Is If there's something that you have that you didn't already submit, you can still submit it. Um, if if there's something that you submitted already that we missed, which we do sometimes, you'll tell us and we'll fix it. 
Um, and then after the review, we'll send you a draft report. We're usually pretty good about getting those to you within four weeks of the visit. Um, so, uh, and then you'll have a chance again to say to us, you got this wrong, right? We submitted this and, or, or here it is even, like we didn't submit it, but we have it now. So we'll change any, any findings um, related, related to that. Um, and then we'll, and then once we've gone through that process, we'll issue a final report. And then there are certain uh, monitoring findings for which you will be required to submit a follow-up plan. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. I think there was a question that came into the chat. While I was yeah, talking. someone's asking if all monitoring takes place virtually by Zoom and with electronically submitted documentation. Yes. For now, um, for the past, actually, since before COVID, we've been doing all monitoring remotely. So, yeah, monitoring is a remote process, at least for now. Um, all right, next slide. Remote monitoring. You you anticipated the next slide. Yeah. So uh, all visits are going to be remote. And again, we're not going to review every single thing that's on the monitoring on the monitoring guide. Right. We're going to focus on the most important things. Um, and we're going to focus on if you've been monitored before anything where you had a finding before. Right. And then anything that's new. Um, and I said this already, we'll send you um, the list of uh, documents from your client files that we want to review. You'll get that list at least two days prior to the monitoring date. You'll let us know if you need more time than that. And then next slide. And then usually what agencies do is they upload all of those client documents because we want to make sure that we're review we don't want to client documents sent by email right we want to make sure that they are um in a secure system so you'll upload all of those documents usually into hmis and we'll review all those documents in hmis so if you get selected for monitoring you'll get instructions for all of this you will um send a ticket to the uh excuse me, HMIS help desk, letting them know that you are authorizing whomever is coming out from our team to do the monitoring, that you're giving us a view only access, time limited, um, in order to do the monitoring. You can also, if you prefer, now this is optional, if your agency has an electronic health record system that's other than HMIS and you don't want to get all of the files out of that system and upload them into HMIS, you can also give us access remote access directly into that system and we're happy to review those documents right in your system so that you don't have any um, any uploading to do that is optional providing time limited limited hmis access is uh is required because there's some things that we're going to want to look at in hmis even if we're looking at uh other things in your own agency's electronic health record system there's a question right. Lauren, yeah. if you've monitored us before, but it was for a different project type, will you still be looking at our prior findings first? It depends upon the, yes, we always look at the prior findings because some of the findings are at the agency level, right? Like, so some of the findings, like your conflict of interest policy is your conflict of interest policy for your agency. It doesn't matter what kind of program we're monitoring, it's the same conflict of interest policy, right? So for some things, yes, the monitoring findings from a previous report would be carried forward if they haven't been corrected. But then for other things, the requirements are different from project type to project type. So we wouldn't really be, um, you know, we wouldn't carry forward those, those findings. And we'll talk about carrying forward findings in a moment. So for anything that you're submitting to us that in advance that is not like confidential client information, right, your policies and procedures, that kind of thing, um, you're going to submit that in Zengen, which is the uh, online grants uh, management database that CT Boss uses. If you're brand new to all of this and you don't know anything about Zengen, there's a link here on this slide where you can uh, get training and information about how to do an upload into Zengen. Shannon can also help you. She's our she's our Zengen whisperer. So if there's anything that you are having trouble with in Zengen, don't suffer alone reach out to Shannon and she'll help you. All right. So um, if you have been monitored before, right, uh, you don't need to send us things that you've already sent us, right? If we, you know, you sent us your conflict of interest policy two years ago and you haven't changed your conflict, your conflict of interest policy, you don't need to resend it to us, right? 
You only need to send us things that you've not previously submitted, policies that you've changed, or where, you know, hopefully where there was a finding on the previous um, monitoring, you've made a change in order to address that finding and you'll submit the updated policy that addresses that previous finding. If there was a finding and you don't submit something new, we will carry forward that finding from the previous visit, right? So if in your previous visit it said that you didn't have the required educational rights policy and you don't submit an educational rights policy, that finding is gonna get carried forward to the next visit, all right? This I alluded to before, so this is the key that you'll see in your monitoring report. And what it does is it basically tells you which things are findings and which things are best practice recommendations. And then among the findings, which things you need to submit a follow-up plan for. So the things in red or pink, those are the most significant things. And those you're going to need to submit a follow-up plan for. Um, the things in yellow are findings and you should correct them, you know, as soon as you're able, um, but you don't have to tell us how you're going to correct them or you don't have to do a follow up plan. And then the things in green are best practice recommendations and it's up to you, right? You can implement them or not implement them. I think there was a question in chat. I got it. Someone was oh, asking when. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're going to do a quick Zoom poll. Are you launching the poll, Shannon, or? Um, I can't. I can do it. Okay, I got it. Pulls. Um. All right. So you should see a Zoom poll now. Yes. We'll give you a couple of minutes to answer. Um. So the first question is, which of these are reasons why CT Boss monitors projects, and you can select all that apply. And then there are two true/false questions. All right, we'll give you another 15 seconds or so to get your answers in. It looks like most people have responded already. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. So the first question, which of these are reasons why CT Boss uh, monitors projects? Uh, almost everyone got this correct. So the first one is not true, right? CT Boss does not recapture funds. We come out and we try to avoid HUD recapturing funds. We don't recapture funds. Um, the next two are correct. So we monitor um, to help you guys understand um, the requirements and prepare for HUD monitoring. And we also monitor because HUD tells us we have to monitor. Um, and then the next two also, almost everyone got these correct. So a project will not receive the standards used for monitoring until the day of the remote monitoring visit. That is false. The standards are up on our website all the time and they were linked on the earlier slides, slide number 11. So you can look at those standards anytime you want. Um, and then the second one, excuse me, the third uh, item is also false. A project that has a lot of monitoring findings will automatically lose its funding. No. Our goal is to help you fix it, right? We don't want to take funding away. The goal is to help you fix it. So that item is false. All right, next slide. <clears throat> so um, now I'm going to go through quickly all of the changes to the monitoring guide, new things or changes that uh, happened uh, either in 2023 or for the current upcoming monitoring period, which is 2024. Next slide. Okay, so um, the first thing is that back, I don't know, probably six months ago now, um, the steering committee adopted the guide, the Permanent Supportive Housing Requirements and Operations Guide, 
that had established for a number of years now all of the requirements for our PSH projects. It used to apply only to the DEMAS projects, right? Um, or a lot of the content in there used to apply only to the DEMAS projects. And now everything in that guide has been adopted for all PSH projects. So if you have a PSH project and you're not already familiar with that guide, it's linked here. Please go and check it out so that the monitoring guide has been updated to reflect that all of the requirements that are outlined in that guide apply to all PSH projects, not just DEMAS projects. Next slide. Um, there's some new information in the guide related to security deposits. We want to make sure, you know, scarce resources. I don't have to tell you guys, right? There's not a lot of money out there for this stuff. And so we want to make sure that um, when there is a security deposit refund owed, that that money is getting returned according to the law, right? That's a legal requirement that landlords, a legal obligation of landlords. And so in order to help ensure that that happens, um, you, you guys should be, when someone is moving into a unit, documenting the condition of that unit, usually through photographs that you would keep uh, in someone's chart that, for example, show that that stain on the carpet was there when the person moved in, right? So that the landlord doesn't later try to recoup money out of the security deposit. And then the same when someone moves out, ideally, you're going into that unit and documenting the condition of the apartment um, at move out so that the landlord doesn't try to claim damage that that wasn't there. Now we get Demis gets that that's not always possible um, because you may not learn that someone has moved out until it's already it's already too late, but whenever you can. Um, and then, you know, the landlord has a legal, legal obligation to to uh, follow the law in the state of Connecticut. And if you don't know a lot about what landlords are and are not allowed to do with security deposits. You can click on the link on this slide. There's a whole bunch of uh, great information there. Um, but we want to make sure that any money that is owed gets returned and that you um, make sure you remind the landlord when someone moves out that they are required to return that money and to whom they should return it. And the to whom part is going to vary depending upon the kind of project it is. So um, for DEMIS projects, DEMIS requires that that money uh, be returned to DEMIS, and there's details in the PSH operating guide that was linked on the last slide about specifically to whom at DEMIS and how that money should be returned. And then for rapid rehousing projects, that money should be returned to the participant, to the tenant, right? So, um, so which is great because it's a little bit of extra money in someone's pocket. Lisa has her hand up. Yeah, and I just want to add that it's really important too when you're requesting the security deposit to be returned that you request that in writing and give an address to where that can be returned to. Um, because sometimes if you don't and then you request it, there can be a conversation stating that they didn't know, uh, so on and so forth. So it just may save you time in the long run. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for jumping in. All right, next slide. Um, so we've also added content into the guide um, because, you know, this, this HUD does not have any income stealing for the COC program. So, I mean, this doesn't happen, right? But theoretically, somebody could make $100,000 a year and still be eligible for case management in PSH. Um, that's an extreme example. Um, so the, So somebody, you know, with an income much less than $100,000 a year, is going to not be eligible for a subsidy, right? So if somebody makes too much money, when you put all their information into the rent calculation tool, the rent calculation tool is going to say that the subsidy is going to pay zero rent because the person, 30% of their income is enough to cover the full rent. If that happens, there may be circumstances where that person is really significantly disabled and still needs the assistance of a case manager in order to sustain that housing and you can keep them enrolled in the program. You should keep them enrolled in the program if the person needs and wants case management assistance, even though they're not getting a subsidy. So it's not automatic that you discharge someone when they're over income for a subsidy. And so if you are a DEMIS PSH project, if that circumstance happens and you decide, um, you know, there, there's the requirement is that you assess whether or not the person needs and wants continued case management. If you determine that there's somebody that is over income for the subsidy that you think should stay enrolled, 
you're going to reach out to Lisa or Alice or someone on their team to have a conversation about that to make sure that everyone's on the same page. If you are from a different kind of um, PSH project that is not a DEMAS project, you can just have your supervisor make that determination, right? You did the assessment, the supervisor determined that the person needs and uh, wants continued case management, and so we're gonna keep that person enrolled in case management even though they're no longer gonna get the subsidy. All right, next slide. <clears throat> so back in 2022, uh, CT Boss got a wonderful new award to help us address unsheltered and rural homelessness in the state. It was called the SNOFO or Supplemental Notice of Funding Opportunity. And through that opportunity, uh, we got several permanent supportive housing projects um, funded, new permanent supportive housing projects. And normally in permanent supportive housing, these are DEMIS permanent supportive housing projects. DEMIS is the recipient on the grant. Normally in those projects, um, in addition to meeting the HUD definition of disability, folks getting the assistance have to meet the DEMIS definition of disability. So they've got to be either seriously mentally ill, have a chronic uh, problem with drugs or alcohol, or both SMI and a chronic problem with drugs and alcohol, or have HIV AIDS. Um, that is not the case for these new PSH projects that were funded under the SNOFO. For these new projects, you can serve anyone who meets the HUD definition of disability because we know that there are folks out there that need PSH that don't have one of those DEMAS qualifying disabilities. So we are not gonna go through all the information today about how to document disability and what the HUD definition is and blah, blah, blah. If you've got questions about that, there's an entire eligibility training that Shannon and I did and that training is linked on slide number 56 in today's deck. All right. Next item. So there's a new section in the guide. I think this was new in 2023, not in 2024. Um, you know, COVID has clearly uh, made it evident to all of us that our programs have got to be prepared um, to pivot quickly in an emergency situation. You guys all did a fabulous job of doing that. Um, we've added some content in the, in the uh, guide that is about that. Um, and so we'll be asking you to submit your emergency and disaster preparedness and response, either plan or policy. Um, and it's got to that, and we'll be looking at that to make sure that it includes a couple of things, right? Um, that you've done some sort of risk assessment to identify which crises are most likely to happen in your program. So for example, if you live within the evacuation zone of a nuclear power plant, or not live if your program is within the evacuation zone of a nuclear power plant, um, or you're located in a flood zone, right? Those are things that are probably you want to be prepared for. Um, you know, if you're in downtown Hartford, wildfire is probably not a big concern for you. Um, to make sure that you've got a plan to coordinate with all of the relevant partners, so your local public health agency and your local emergency management team, for example. Um, you've got protocols to minimize the impact of the disaster on the people that you serve uh, and to ensure that you can either continue providing the services, um, you know, throughout the, the situation that's emergency emer emerging or at least get those services back up and running as quickly as possible uh, after the situation um, is no longer an active emergency. And then you want to make sure that you've got a plan to communicate what's going on with your staff and your clients and uh, all of your partners. Next slide. Um, you want to make sure that the, that your policies or your plan include what happens after the emergency is over, right? How do you look at what went well and what didn't go well and then make adjustments accordingly um, and that people on your team know what the plan is before the emergency happens, right? So you've got some protocol um, where you're, you know, training staff, informing staff about what, um, about what they're supposed to do if there's an emergency. So, and then similarly, there's a new section of the guide that's specifically related to infection control and public health emergencies. Um, and um, and this, this is uh, self-reported, right? So we're gonna send you some questions, you're gonna fill them out and you're gonna tell us whether or not you've got all of these things in place. Um, and those things include, again, making sure that in a public health emergency, 
you're able either to continue operations or get those uh, operations back up and running as quickly as possible, um, that you're coordinating with specifically with your public health partners around that emergency. So that's usually your local department of health. Um, that you're, you know, these situations are rapidly evolving, as you know, and so that you've got uh, a plan in place for how you are monitoring new developments and then getting that information out to your staff and your clients. Um, that you're, you know, not just taking care of staff of clients, but also taking care of staff, right? That you're uh, helping people uh, with some self care resources and strategies, um, and that you've got protocols in place to be sure that you're reducing infection risks and you're screening people for symptoms and you're testing uh, in accordance with whatever guidance you're getting from local public health authorities. Um, and that you're always working to build vaccine confidence among both your participants and your staff um, and coordinating with public heart, health partners to access whatever uh, vaccine resources and opportunities exist out there, um, in, especially uh, for the folks who are highest risk on your staff and among your client uh, population. So, all right, a couple more slides here and then I'm gonna pass it over to Shannon. So um, this is actually not new. The emergency transfer plan has uh, been in place for quite a while. Uh, under VAWA, all COCs are required to have a plan that enables folks who are um, at risk, you know, they feel that they are unsafe because of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, or human trafficking that we've got a plan to transfer them to a different unit if they believe that they are unsafe in their current unit. I'm not going to go through all of this. We're actually going to be doing a training just on all of the VAWA requirements coming up in a few months. And so we'll go more into depth about this then. Um, what is new is that, you know, with all kinds of rights, right, it's one thing to say people have a right, but if they don't know that they have a right, then it's not very helpful to them. So um, we uh, are requiring that we've done a notice. That notice is linked here on this slide. It explains to people in pretty simple language what their um, VAWA emergency transfer rights are. And you as funded uh, projects are required to give people that notice, uh, regardless of whether or not you believe them to be a survivor of uh, any of these kinds of violence, because you don't always know. So you're gonna give it to everyone um, and you're gonna give it to them the CANs are gonna give it to them when they're applying for assistance. You're gonna give it to them uh, when they enter your project and at least once a year when you do annual recertification. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, same thing, you know, for a long time, right? Always people have had the right to grieve in our projects. Um, what, we, what the steering committee adopted, a requirement that you are notifying people proactively of that right to grieve. There's a notice that's linked here on this slide that you are required to give to people. Um, again, the CANs will give it when people are applying. You should give it when they're entering your project, and you should give it again um, at least annually. Usually, you're probably going to do that when you're recertifying. And for all of these things, we want to try to spend a couple minutes talking about it, not just handing people a piece of paper. It's going to make it a lot more likely that people understand and know the rights than you know they're just signing off on a piece of paper. We did an entire training um, just on the grievance processes that are available to folks, and that training is linked here on this slide. Um, we have updated the Connecticut um, Applicant and Participant Bill of Rights. It's much simpler now. I think it's a one-page form now. It used to be many pages. Um, and so you want to make sure that you are giving people the updated version of that Participant Bill of Rights which is linked here. And then we've also created, you can go to the next slide, Shannon. We've also created a form that you can use to acknowledge that you've given people all of these three notices. So um, it's a form that acknowledges someone has received the Participant Bill of Rights, the Emergency Transfer Rights, and their Grievance Rights. You can use this specific form to document that if you want. It's a tool that's available for you you do not need to use this specific form. You've got a document that people received all of these things, but you can do that in any way that works for your, for your project. All right, um, we'll do the Zoom poll real quick and then I will turn it over to Shannon. 
You want me to do it? Uh, no. Okay. Just slow, but I'm getting there. Okay. Oh, I did the wrong thing. Probably should have had you do it. <laughs> uh, back. Here we go. Launch. All right, everybody should see it now. So, and there are just two questions for this one. The first one is a true or false, and the second one is a multiple choice, and you can pick as many of the responses as you think are correct. The first one is false. Yeah. Someone's trying to give the answers there. <laughs> All right. It looks like most people have participated. We'll give you another 10 seconds or so to get your answers in, and then we'll go over the results. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So again, you guys, uh, most people got this correct. So the first question, when a participant's income is too high to qualify for a rent subsidy, they must be discharged from a PSH project. That is false. Someone can have uh, income that's too high to get a subsidy, but still need and want case management, and they can stay enrolled in the PSH excuse me, in the PSH project in order to get that case management uh, if needed. The second question, um, which of these CT bus rights notices are projects required to provide to all participants? The correct answers here are the applicant bill of rights, the participant and applicant bill of rights, the emergency transfer rights, and the grievance rights. Fabulous if you're giving people information about their voters rights, we love it but it's not something that we require at CT Boss, and nor will we monitor on it. All right, I'm gonna stop the share and I am gonna turn it over to Shannon. Okay, just wanted to take a moment if people have any questions before we dive into avoiding monitoring findings. No, raise your hand or chat. I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, so. okay. Um, so as Lauren said, do not fear the findings, but here are a few ways to avoid um, getting any findings. So as you see on the right hand side of the screen here, there are several checklists um, where DEMIS um, or, or um, DOH rapid rehousing or other rapid rehousing um, or all CEOC projects, there are checklists for each and every document um, or, or item that is required to be in people's files. So that can help you ensure that everything is in order for monitoring. And on the left-hand side, um, the, those each form that are on those checklists are on the CT Boss website on the resources page under the headings DEMAS COC rental assistance documents or DOH rapid rehousing documents. <clears throat> so, um, Again, avoiding surprises like Lucy here is experiencing. Um, we recommend a process through which supervisors review all eligibility documentation. Um, eligibility documentation continues to be, <clears throat> excuse me, one of our more common findings, and it is a recapture risk if HUD were to come and find that the person wasn't eligible in the first place to be admitted to the project. So that's why we emphasize supervisors reviewing that eligibility documentation. And we're gonna go through some eligibility stuff in a couple of slides here. Um, all individuals must <clears throat> have proper documentation for eligibility at project entry. There's often a gap from the CAN documentation to the time that a person is entered into the project. So please look at that and ensure 
that people are eligible as of the date they're entering the project. Um, it is not the CAN's responsibility for that documentation to be um, up to date and to be eligible. It's the it's the admitting project's responsibility to look at that documentation and make sure it meets the requirements. Um, we also recommend that your agency develop a process in which each chart is audited at least once a year by a supervisor. There's so much going on with each household, with each program, agency, turnover, that it's important to set aside times to review the charts from an audit perspective, and it can help folks keep on track with each client, each person in your program, and in good shape for monitoring. And, and it may be that you review a subset of charts, not every chart <laughs> every year, right? You might select to do five charts or 10 charts the way that, same way that we do for monitoring. Lisa has your hand up. Yeah, and I just want to remind folks that um, the homeless verification needs to be documented up until the point you either, they either sign their certificate and or move into their apartment. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, clarify that from, you know, the enrollment date in general. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. So homeless requirements are on the next couple of slides. This slide covers all projects except for YHDP. Um, again, inadequate eligibility documentation is a more common finding and a recapture risk. I'm just going to reiterate that. Um, so currently, all PSH projects as of January 1st, 2021 are 100% dedicated plus. That's the, um, that's the criteria for entering PSH projects. Um, <clears throat> all the rest of the projects here, rapid rehousing, transitional housing, street outreach, category four is an eligible is an eligible category, homeless category four, which is fleeing domestic violence or human trafficking. And also the household does not have another option um, up for housing or for um, all the rapid, the rapid rehousing, transitional housing street outreach projects um, must be category one for the HUD requirement as well, which is literally homeless. So the person is living in a shelter in transitional housing or a place not meant for human habitation, such as a car, in a park, in a tent in the woods, other places like that. So this slide covers YHDP homeless requirements. As you can see, YHDP projects also fall into categories one and four that I just went through. Uh, but there are a couple of projects here that add in category two, imminent risk. Imminent risk um, means that the household it, within the next 14 days, that's what HUD defines as imminent, will experience literal homelessness and does not have another option. So uh, youth, youth um, eligible for, um, Category two youth are eligible for shelter diversion, rapid exit, and youth navigator programs. Here are some eligibility verification tools that are posted on our website. And, and the, these first three were updated this past February, CT Boss Homeless Verification Form, Disabling Condition, CT Boss, um, COC form and sample letters from street outreach and shelter. So these sample letters will say everything that needs to say in order to be eligible um, for your projects. Um, self certification overview is also on our website. Um, some sample letters documenting dedicated plus some sample project intake policies and the YHDP eligibility tools. These documents go way more into each and every eligibility requirement for the projects and um, they're great resources. I just wanted to point out for the sample intake policy, they need to be customized. So it's a sample. So it'll say insert agency name here or insert program name here and we've done some monitorings where people will not have customized them so please make sure you take that extra step put your agency and or program name in and any other place it needs to be customized so that it's up to date for your agency and your program the 
we're switching gears here and we're going to talk a little bit about how to avoid common fiscal findings. So when you think about the question, what are we allowed, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> What are we allowed to spend money on in this project? There are two important things to keep in mind. Um, one, is the cost eligible? And two, is the cost approved? So an eligible cost is any cost defined by the COC program interim rule. And there's a link to that in an upcoming slide. Um, an eligible cost you, in an, for an eligible cost, you are able to spend match funds on any of those areas. But non-match funds, the money that you get from HUD for these programs, um, must be spent on approved costs. So the most common budget line items in CTBOS are rental assistance, supportive services, and project administration. Leasing, operating, HMIS are also um coc budget line items but they're way less frequently used in ct boss um approved costs are projects in your are our costs in your project budget so hud approves a budget as a part of your coc project application in the competition every year those items, those budget line items that you submit for and HUD approves are your approved costs. Only expenses included there are approved and those are the only expenses that you are allowed to spend COC funds on for those approved budget line items. If you spend money on an Ill ineligible cost, that's a recapture risk. So tips on cost eligibility, know what budget line items are in your project. Again, um, these listed here are eligible budget line items, but the most frequently used in CT Boss are rental assistance, supportive services, and project administration. Um, uh, Housing Innovations conducted a series of fiscal requirements requirement webinars um, and those webinars the slides and the recordings are here on the trainings page for more information on those items next we're going to dive into project administration versus indirect costs a little bit um, project admin as I just said is a budget line item. So in that budget line item, in this interim rule, there are very specific things that HUD says you are allowed to spend money on. So examples of that are environmental review, evaluating programs, working on your annual performance report, um, compliance um, with HUD required items, training on HUD required items, um, agencies often confuse project administration with indirect costs. Indirect costs are general agency overhead expenses that aren't easily assignable to a specific projects. So examples of some <clears throat> indirect costs are payroll, human resources expenses, information technology, your IT department, those kinds of expenses. So while during the last competition, we saw some additional agencies and projects claiming indirect. There's still a good portion of projects that are not claiming indirect on your project application. If you want to bill for indirect, you have to say that on your project application. There's a page in eSNAPS on each project application that asks if you're going to apply for indirect costs. You have to check yes or no. Then. If you check yes, you have the option to um, use a negotiated indirect cost rate or NICRA is the, is the part of how HUD says that. If your agency has a, a NICRA, you must use that rate. Otherwise, you can use the 10% de minimis rate. Um, so you have to check which one you'll use there as well. 
If you use indirect costs, it does not add money to your budget. If your budget is, for instance, $100,000 and you say, yes, I'm going to use my 10% NICRA, that doesn't mean you get $10,000 on top of that $100,000, but it will allow you to charge things within your existing budget that you otherwise couldn't recoup. Um, and the documentation requirements are way less onerous with indirect costs than with admin. If you are getting both admin and indirect costs, your agency must make sure that each expense is classified as either, as either admin or indirect, and you're not double dipping, you're not double billing. You cannot treat admin funds you can't do the flip side. You can't treat admin funds as if they're indirect. You need that documentation for them, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, yeah, so you need backup documentation for project administration. So if you're billing $7,000, for instance, to admin, you need documentation showing that staff time valued at at least $7,000 um, is spent on eligible administrative tasks, or you need documentation of other eligible costs, such as an audit or legal expenses. You can't simply say, we have a $100,000 grant, 7% of which is admin, so we build 7% to admin. You have to have that backup documentation for it. Conversely, you don't need backup documentation for indirect. It's billed at a percentage based on either the NICRA that I talked about or the 10% de, de minimis rate. And that's based on modified total direct costs. There's a training again on the CT Boss training page specifically on indirect costs that goes dives deep into this topic. So please look at those slides or and or listen to the recording for more information on that. Was there something, was there a question in the chat? No? Okay. Okay. Here's the, so that this is the training that I referenced. The links are here also. So just another plug to consider claiming indirect costs, especially if your project might be struggling with, um, with underspending, this is another way to recoup some costs that you wouldn't otherwise be able to bill for. Documenting time. So again, under the, well, this could be under admin or under supportive services, but for employees who work on more than one project and or budget line item, time sheets must support must be supported by personnel activity logs or other backup. You can have case notes, you can have maintenance logs, that kind of thing. Um, Timesheets um, have to reconcile with activity logs and there's a sample personnel activity log linked here. We also advise that um, there's a periodic review of these documentations just to make sure that it's, it's so easy. And again, it's not, not, not something we have to tell you to lose track of who's doing what, when. And um, we ask that um, your supervisors take a look and review that information periodically to make sure everything is in compliance. Addressing findings. So um, as Lauren said, as we've said, there are going to be findings um, and there are several things you can do in terms of addressing them. Some are required um, to document back to us and some are not. But for all findings, we ask that programs review internally to look at what caused the issue, right? So are the agency policies and procedures not either up to date or not sufficient to be in compliance? Are the staff not trained on the policies? Um, has there been staff turnover and that information just wasn't transferred to the new people? Or is it a matter of capacity where staff needs more supervision and more support to, um, to, to do the work that they're doing? Um, to determine the scope and severity of the issue. So first and foremost, again, like Lauren was saying, how we prioritize different things, are is the finding something that puts the client or staff at risk, right? Those 
we want to um, look at more closely and act on more quickly than we might do other items. Um, is this an isolated mistake or is this a systemic issue? Um, is this something we need to look at across all of our programs and um, agency or is this just a specific instance? Um, does this uh, issue involve fraud, waste, or abuse? Or is it a recapture risk? So looking at the scope and severity and then determining what actions to take and how quickly. Steps uh, number three, establish a plan to prevent the issue from happening again. Again, we ask you to do this for all findings. So including specific action steps, who is responsible for what by when for each action step. For um, the more serious uh, monitor issues, findings, uh, usually the ones in pink, sometimes the ones in yellow, um, we, are, we ask everyone to submit a monitoring follow-up plan to CT Boss. Um, we review that and we get, uh, we get back to you whether it's accepted or whether we might have some additional suggestions for you. Um, you implement your plan and again, prioritize the most serious issues. And then we just think we ask that you check in with your team quarterly to evaluate your progress, adjust the plan as needed. It can be as many of these process, it can be a living um, kind of a document and plan that adjusts with um, different situations as things evolve in your program. Preparing for HUD monitoring. Um, so just as CT Boss has um, has ways that we just um, what am I saying? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to start over. Um, HUD also monitors for COC projects, right? Just as we do. They recently updated their process on how they choose which projects to monitor. So some of them are similar to what we do in CT Boss, and some of them are different. The HUD notice that describes all the details about that process is linked here. For any of you who don't enjoy curling up and reading this in your free time or, or in your work time, um, we're going to summar summarize what that notice says. So um, the factors that HUD uses to assess risk and select for monitoring are inaccurate or untimely reporting, right? You don't send in your APR on time. Or there's many confused, they're confusing or incorrect things in there when they do get it when a project has multiple subrecipients, when there's staff turnover or staff capacity issues, like HUD's reaching out um, and they haven't been able to be in touch or get a good response from a program, that's a red flag. Um, total cumulative, cumulative grant awards for recipient of more than $2.17 million, or leasing or rental assistance grants uh, I mean awards, budget line item awards, greater than $400,000. Okay, more. That would warrant a monitoring failure to draw from ELOCs quarterly. Previous monitoring findings, no monitoring in the past three years. Um, untimely submission of audits or presence of audit findings or audit recommendations, and then negative media exposure or complaints um, similar to Lauren, what Lauren talked about for our criteria for CT Boss's criteria. All right. So just as CT Boss and DEMAS monitoring, this is what I was thinking of in the last slide, but it wasn't the right slide, um, has a published guide, so does HUD. Uh, so it's not, you have the ability to prepare um, more than you might think, because just as we have our monitoring guide posted, they have their monitoring information posted. So it's kind of like a take home test, right? They, you can see what they're going to look at and the links for those are here. HUD has several monitoring areas. Um, they're all listed here, um, and they will send you a letter beforehand telling you which areas they're going to monitor for. You can pull the monitor exhibit 
for those areas and know what they're going to look at, right? Um, one of the things that they almost always monitor for is eligibility. Just to let you know that. Okay, this is just an opportunity for you all to give us some feedback. What items from today's training will you all follow up on? You, your agency, your team, you can feel free to put information in the chat or unmute to share, however you wanna share that information. Internal monitoring from Carrie, thank you. That's a great so way to be prepared. Go ahead, go ahead, Lauren. No, no, I was just gonna say the same thing. <clears throat> Updating policies and procedures, Elaine Matt just put in the in the chat. So some of these are new requirements, so you might need to update your policies in certain areas. Deanna just shared emergency preparedness. So again, that's a new requirement. So you may not have, or you're, you know, sometimes some of your agencies are huge, right? Your agency may actually have emergency preparedness policies or a plan that you're just not aware of. Um, so whether it's, you know, making sure that your team has that information or your agency actually establishing those things either way. <clears throat> Continue to thank Lisa C regarding her endeavors to review samples of eligibility documents. We are all very thankful to Lisa Callahan yeah. for many reasons. That's just yes. one of them. All right. Feel free to keep adding in the chat or raise your hand. I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Does anyone have any final questions? Um, or or we, we welcome suggestions too, right? So as you just talked about with emergency preparedness, we've been prioritizing that thing since that topic since COVID. Um, it's, it's taken on increased importance, right? It's always been there, but with COVID, it just was, as you all know, unprecedented times, right? So, um, but if there are different things that you believe we should be focusing on, um, if there are topics you'd like to see us prioritize, please put them in the chat or you can feel free to send us an email. Um, and as always, if you have ideas for how to make monitoring more helpful and or more efficient for your agency or your project, please feel free to let us know that too. Lynette added that she's going to work on chart monitoring and looking at eligibility documents. Lynette, if I got that wrong and you think those are things that we should focus more on, let me know. <laughs> All right, next slide. Additional resources for you all. Um, please take a look at the CT Bus website. There's a ton of information on the training page, on their resources page. Um, match monitoring. Willa, uh, I okay, that might be a topic that people want more information on. Okay. Um, so onboarding trainings. Um, we're doing for staff COC projects are all included here. Onboarding webinars are on the CT Boss training page. So there's intro to boss um, COC coming soon in January. Key policies and administrative requirements is also later in January. Participant eligibility documentation. We're going to do a webinar that on that in web in February. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, no, we, we did a webinar. We did a webinar on that already in February. Uh, so that's recorded. It's up okay. There. So the okay. So things, are, are things that we've already done that are recorded that are posted. Yeah, thank you. Um, sure. Housing requirements. We did two sessions on that in May. They're, they were posted fiscal requirements. Two sessions are posted. And then 
grant management requirements um, we did in November. Wait, we did November of this year, right? Yeah, okay, so that's, oh, that's wrong. Okay, that's wrong. Yeah. and the DMS training catalog is also um, posted on the CC Boss website. Uh, there are a plethora of topics uh, in that one, in that area. So I believe that's more for um, supporters for case management staff and supervisors. There's an orientation for new PSH case managers. There's service planning, assessments and acuity index, motivational interviewing, addressing substance abuse, and lots more in that DEMIS training catalog. So um, feel free to take advantage of that as well. So I just wanted to say on this slide something new that we developed. You know, we know that uh, project part of why we're doing these onboarding trainings is because we know that you all are struggling with staff turnover. And so in addition to doing recording all of these so that every time somebody comes on board, you can have them, you know, review these webinars. We also compiled um, onboarding recommendations so that you can use that to see what resources are available to train new staff as they as they come on board so if you've got new staff on board and you're not familiar with those recommendations uh, please click on this link and check them out and if uh, there's anything we can do to make that document or any of these resources more helpful just let us know all right Rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing requirements. So there's the rapid rehousing operations guide. It's posted on the website and the link is here. And the permanent supportive housing operations guide is posted here. All HUD PSH or COC CT boss PSH projects are required to follow the guidance in the operations guide and all um, CT Boss Rapid Rehousing projects are required to follow the guidance in the Rapid Rehousing Operations Guide. Um, there are trainings on each of the guides on the CT Boss website, and um, there are forms on the resources page for the required forms. Again, if you have um, ideas for additional trainings or resources you'd like us to provide, please let us know. You can tell us in the chat or unmute. My. And then here's our contact information. So again, you can let us know by email if you have additional ideas for trainings, resources, anything. So I think we'll stay on for a couple minutes if people have questions that we didn't get to answer. Um, you're welcome to hop off now or stay on to hear any questions that other folks have. Um, and we appreciate your time as always. We know that yes. you're busy. And so thank you for being here with us today. Uh, we appreciate your time and really all of the amazing work uh, that you're doing every day to help folks experiencing homeless get housing and, and uh, get stable in that housing and uh, move on with their lives, do great things. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording. We'll stop. Yeah.